Hello, welcome to another one of our digital slide review sessions. Uh, I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, I'm pleased to be uh, joining you with uh, part of our Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, which is jointly sponsored by the Digital Pathology Association and PATH Presenter. Our case today comes from the realm of GYN pathology. Um, it's a 34 year old woman who has uh, been found to have a, uh, an enlarged pelvic mass that seems to be unilateral. Um, and so uh, that leads to some radiographic studies, which uh, demonstrate uh, indeed that she does have a very large pelvic mass with some peripheral areas of calcification. Here you can see it extending off of one side of the adnexi and sort of compressing the bladder and extending up beyond the pelvis into almost the mid abdomen. Um, so uh, with those calcifications and sort of a cystic look, look at least part of it, uh, the belief is that this is probably a teratomatous lesion. And so uh, serum markers are drawn and she comes to surgery. At the time of surgery, uh, they resect this specimen, uh, which uh, is found to contain a few areas of hair, as we can see here on this gross uh, specimen, and some sort of sebus, sebum uh, type of uh, glistening yellowish uh, material. Uh, but it also has uh, some other features that uh, look a little bit different. Uh, so there's a knob, nodule of tissue here that's sort of necrotic looking, hemorrhagic. Uh, some areas here that are a little bit more fleshy, and uh, obviously then some fat and pigmented tissues and all these other sorts of things that we occasionally encounter uh, in a uh, teratoma. So is this a typical teratoma, you know, just a cystic lesion that's going to be benign, or is this something that we need to uh, freeze and be worried about? Well, I think uh, you have to ask the question, when is a teratoma not just a teratoma? And of course, uh, anytime we find immature neural features, uh, those are indicators of an immature teratoma um, and uh, potentially more significant. Additionally, if we see features that look like uh, uh, thyroid uh, parenchyma, um, colloid type material, uh, dematous uh, areas, that should raise concern and certainly prompt a frozen section to verify that because these lesions can be more significant as well. Uh, additionally, you may see other tissues that uh, represent secondary somatic type malignancies that are derived from the uh, non-germ cell elements of the teratoma and can develop uh, squamous carcinomas, adenocarcinomas, other types of tumors. And then lastly, we have the group of associated germ cell tumors, the so-called mixed germ cell tumor teratoma type lesions. And these may have variable fleshy areas, hemorrhagic areas, partly necrotic areas, and so forth, and also may be associated with elevated uh, um, serum tumor markers, of course. So uh, with those uh, slightly abnormal uh, fleshy areas, we opted to do a frozen section. Um, unaware at the time of uh, the sort of uh, uh, other issues that may be involved in this patient, uh, unaware of the tumor markers to be explicit. Um, and as you can see here on this low magnification, this does not just uh, look like uh, regular somatic, uh, cutaneous, uh, sebaceous, and other type of tissues. And in fact, it looks like it's a neoplastic proliferation with a fair amount of uh, sort of intervening blue mucoid uh, tissue um, maybe some uh, eosinophilic cells here in some areas, um, and a degree of atypia in many of these cells uh, that is uh, not trivial. Uh, so here, <clears throat> some cells sort of floating in a mucoid background, um, moderate degree of atypia, maybe a little tubular pattern, possibly some either squamoid or maybe even, if you will, hepatoid cells, these more eosinophilic cells here uh, in these areas, and then these sort of delicate areas. So uh, a lot of thoughts went through our mind. Is this a mucinous carcinoma? Is this a germ cell tumor? Um, is it something else? Um, but based on the sort of uh, pattern and the other associated uh, uh, teratomatous features, we wondered if this might be a yolk sac tumor, particularly given this, this small ductular delicate uh, pattern that we see here. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, 
you don't want to jump uh, right away and you want to make sure that you haven't uh, overlooked something on your frozen section. So you, of course, uh, evaluate the other areas of the slide, uh, which of course we did. And uh, we just noticed down here at this edge, uh, there's a slightly different appearance. Um, and so here we're seeing um, some more mesenchymal elements, you know, some lymphoid tissue, um, and then a lot of blue cells. And uh, if we look closely here, I think you'll believe me when I say that I think that some of these cells are making small rosettes. Uh, and therefore, this would qualify this lesion as uh, not just a germ cell tumor, but also an immature teratoma uh, if we are making uh, immature uh, neuroglial elements, as well as the other features of the hair, sebum, and uh, other epithelial components that we would expect to see. So with that information, uh, we were prepared to, to give a call back to the surgeon. And uh, um, so uh, I got on the telephone and spoke with the surgeon in the OR and said, uh, does this patient have a, uh, any elevated tumor markers? And uh, she quickly chimed in and said, oh yes, her AFP is sky high. <laughs> well, bingo. So the diagnosis uh, was affirmed that this is indeed a yolk sac tumor. Um, and uh, associated with an immature teratomatous component. So with that, we come back and we do further examination of the remainder of the tissue. Uh, we find other um, elements. Here's some bone as uh, indicated by the calcifications we saw on the radiograph. Uh, we see some variable uh, fat, mesenchymal, and adnexal structures, along with uh, <clears throat> some more uh, 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 germ cell tumor right here, uh, as well as more mature uh, neuroglial elements, uh, which uh, occasionally include uh, <clears throat> neurons, uh, as you can see here, a uh, nice um, almost motor neuron type of uh, cell, um, lymphoid cells, <clears throat> and uh, of course the usual uh, adnexal structures mixed with fat. Um, and uh, I always like to see some of the bony structures that we can uh, identify as well. Um, and here uh, we see a very nice uh, germinative uh, tooth structure as well. Uh, of course, you can find fully formed teeth uh, in uh, mature cystic teratomas or immature teratomas on occasion. Uh, but this one is so nicely cut as to demonstrate the different uh, germinative, germinative layers of the uh, tooth formation. Uh, so that it could almost be used for an embryologic uh, study uh, of the same. Um, interestingly, on this so slide, we did not identify uh, immature teratomatous elements. We did have more of the yolk sac uh, tumor, which I've uh, indicated already in parts of uh, this uh, slide. Uh, and then here we have more of that here. Um, as you examine this, you, of course, want to be uh, alert to make sure that there are no other uh, mixed germ cell uh, elements, uh, dysgerminoma or uh, embryonal carcinoma, uh, which we did not uh, identify. Uh, and then uh, one additional uh, slide was uh, uh, located, which uh, did again have an area of uh, immature teratoma here uh, in this corner. So uh, in addition, we have some immature cartilage, some epithelial structures, and again, bone, uh, fat, and mesenchyme. Uh, so grading uh, the immature teratomatous component, and this is actually very nice because you have that right next to some of the yolk sac uh, features here. Um, as you recall, uh, we grade immature teratomas based on the uh, quantity of uh, immature neuroglial cells uh, on a given slide. Um, and rank them based on the number of low power fields. So uh, in this uh, particular case, uh, we had immature glial elements on two slides, and in both of them, they were entirely contained within a single low power field, uh, making this a, a grade one uh, immature teratoma, which is uh, prognostically significant because that will 
mean that really it's the yolk sac tumor rather than the immature teratoma that's going to drive uh, behavior. Uh, now, just for the uh, academic interest, we of course did some additional immunohistochemical staining. Um, here is a nice uh, example of uh, one of the stains that you might uh, choose to use on that yolk sac tumor. This is a glipocan 3 stain, um, which uh, stains the uh, yolk sac cells quite nicely. Um, here we have um, the alpha fetoprotein, uh, which uh, is surprisingly uh, sparse in terms of positive staining. There is some specific positive staining in the tumor, as you can see here. Uh, but really quite sparse given the fact that the uh, serum levels were, I think, well over 25,000 international units. Uh, but this is certainly positive staining. Uh, but it underlines the fact that on small biopsies of yolk sac tumor, you may not uh, have uh, uniform positive staining with this marker. Uh, and of course, uh, further uh, affirming the diagnosis is this uh, immunohistochemical marker, a nuclear marker, uh, SALL4. Uh, which shows a uniform, strong nuclear positivity throughout the uh, tumor cells uh, of the yolk sac component. So our uh, uh, final diagnosis here is mixed immature teratoma yolk sac tumor. Uh, this is uh, not a frequent occurrence, but it does occur, uh, the two of these, uh, either mature or immature uh, in combination with uh, several of the germ cell tumors, but yolk sac tumor is by far the most frequently encountered in this scenario. Um, and although usually we're gonna be seeing this in the uh, gonad, um, it is possible to encounter this in other sites. And so having an awareness of the possibility when you're dealing with a thoracic or a central nervous system uh, germ cell uh, or teratomatous lesion, that uh, these can be uh, coexistent is a significant uh, point to remember. So our final sign out diagnosis today, oh, let me just touch on one other fact. Uh, the varieties of patterns that can be seen with a yolk sac tumor is uh, indeed quite protean. Uh, so we have our case, fairly typical type of tumor, which you might dif uh, differentiate from clear cell carcinoma, though not uh, certainly in the same age group. Uh, but we have several other variations on yolk sac tumor, the polyvesicular vitiligo duct, which is composed of very small cysts, very flattened cuboidal columnar cells. It can be occasionally mistaken for juvenile granulosa cell tumor or multicystic uh, serous tumors. Solid form, which can uh, be mistaken for dysgerminoma. Um, a more glandular uh, form, which we have a little bit of that. Um, but these will generally have uh, eosinophilic globules, prominent subnuclear vacuoles, um, and can occasionally look like some of these other more typical uh, endometrioid tumors and so forth. And finally, the hepatoid variant, uh, which has large uniform and eosinophilic gran granular cells that uh, typically will uh, st uh, stain with HEPAR1, uh, arginase, and so forth, and uh, have uh, uh, easily be confused with metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma or other uh, oncocytic uh, neoplasms. So just to review uh, those various patterns that can be seen. Now, our final sign-out diagnosis today, mixed immature teratoma, grade one, and yolk sac tumor occurring uh, together in this uh, large ovarian uh, uh, neoplasm. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed that and that uh, picked up a few pearls here and there. If you like this, please uh, hit the like button and uh, subscribe to the channel so that we can share additional materials with you as uh, time comes along. Um, we appreciate the time you spent with us and hope that uh, your day goes well and that uh, you'll join us again soon on another program. So until next time, thanks so much for joining us.